disco ball. Come on. God, that intro just totally distracts me in a good way, in a positive way. If you have a copy of God's Word, it's because you're going to heaven when you die. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're in week number three of the series, Assorted Relationships. How many of you in a relationship? Raise your hand. Okay, good. That means that you're listening. We are all in a relationship. Here's your synoptic sentence for the day for all campuses. My heart breaks. My heart breaks big time. Watching people make relationship decisions that undermine their relationships. Make relationship decisions that undermine their relationships. And that isn't just dating relationships, marriage relationships. That could be uh, something relating to business. That could be a career choice. That could be you walking through just minor things, financial decisions. And, and for me personally, nothing more detrimental. I, I really want to get at the root of this whole series, which is the root of our Christ um, walk. And that is this. If you want to show that Jesus is real, love the people closest to you the way Jesus has commanded you to. I don't need a boycott. I don't need to know what translation you're reading. I don't need to know whether or not you boycott Netflix right now because the naughty naughty's on it and you're like, I'm off. I don't need to see you're fasting from social media for eight months because you're addicted to whatever you're addicted to. I don't need that. Here's what I want. If you want to change the world, love the people closest to you the way Jesus has asked us to love. We're going to change the world. The whole world. I mean, I, I don't need another quiet time, even though you should have them. I don't need another Bible study. I just need to, if you will, evaluate my assorted relationships, which I have many, and see where I'm at. And see how I'm doing. Ask my wife. Ask my kids. Ask my co-laborers. Ask people in my life and see where I'm at. Because most of us, want to live our best life through relationships and that's why we've given several tips to allow you to be successful and first corinthians 13 has been our central passage scripturally when you uh, were a child verse 11 you thought and reasoned like a child but when you got armpit hair you might want to write that in the notes there just parenthetically note that when I got armpit hair, I stopped acting like a little kid and used Old Spice. Now that is not a real translation for those of you that are confused biblically here. I don't know what your category is of growing up, but I'd say most of us in the sound of my voice are almost there. If you love like a kid, you're not loving like Christ asked you to. That's why it gets... Avril Lavigne. That's why it gets complicated. Things get a little bit weird. Things get a little bit confusing. And then we don't know what's going on. It's about loving like Christ has called us to love. Let me say it to you this way. Your direction, not your intention determines your destination relationally. Let me say this again. Your direction, you can even change the word there if you want action. The steps. Your direction, not your intention. Well, I meant to, I didn't mean to say that. Well, I meant to, go, I, I meant to call it, I meant to text, I meant to, I meant to, I meant to call it, I meant to call it, I meant to, I'm getting, no, no, no. Not intention. Intention does not count. Everybody go with me. Just the loudest buzzer you pop possibly can after I say intention doesn't count. You ready? Intention doesn't count. And exactly. And why do we say our intentions? Because we're making excuses. And we all know about excuses. Direction, not your intention, does what? 
Not only tells love, it determines where you're headed. It determines what's going to transpire. It determines the outcome. It's this simple. If you want to love, if you want great relationships, it's not intention. Well, it's, you know, if he would, if, you know, well, if she would, well, if, if you know, we'd had a different job. Well, if you know. With it, it, change your direction today. What? Love like Christ has asked you to. We're going to look at four ways to do that. But before we do, let me just throw a few myths at you. Why? Because we learn Here's what I'm learning. Notice I'm using ING, not ED. ING, that's Wisdom 101 for those of us that are married. Don't use learned because we're not there yet, right? ING, when you get to heaven, you can use some EDs. It says, we learn from our mistakes that matter least. You say, what says? My notes. Let me say it again. We learn from things that matter least. I'm just throwing it out here. I'm going raw and real. I, I won't make this all churchy, but let me just tell you, here's what I'm learning. Like, people do stuff like this. They learn, and they fix their social media passwords. They're like, man, it's broke. They fix it. <laughs> man, I learned my lesson. And when it comes to some fixing some error on the washing machine, or <laughs> fixing, uh, you know, just the smallest things, you know, getting a credit card that's up to date or my debit card or whatever. We, we don't have any problem fixing things that don't really matter. But the things that matter the most, we sweep the most under the rug. Marriage issues, money issues, intimacy issues, communication issues. Oh, I'll fix my social media password. Oh, I'll make sure I take care of all my emails. Oh, I'll make sure that I put new uh, scent in the, in the scent thing, whatever those are. But you know what? I, I'm going to keep you in manipulation hell. Because you knew better. But I'm going to fix my Instagram because it matters. Well, what's going on? <laughs> it's crazy. I want to make this pretty. I'm trying the best I can. I even look like I'm dressed up like a mime up here. Somebody ought to get this. By the way, the word mime comes from Philippians chapter 2. It says this in verse number 4. It says, be imitators of Christ. It says, mime him. Free. Don't even have to tithe on it. Next thing I want to say is this. We, we try to fix the ones that matter the least, and we repeat our mistakes in the areas that matter the most. <laughs> is that wild? We just keep saying it, keep spending it, keep doing it, keep clicking on it. And we wonder why. You already know. Why? Because I was a child. Now I'm a grown-up. Can you, what, what was the big thing when you turned 18? I've had three kids that have done that. Now my fourth saying the same thing. Who turned 18 in November? I'm watching it. I'm seeing it. Guess what the big thing was when they turned 18? Guess what it was? The big mature thing was, you want to take a guess? Get me out of here. Yeah, right? How many of you couldn't wait to get out of your town? Raise your hand if you're that way at 18. Get out of the house. Get out of the, your mom's Buick, whatever it was. Raise your hand. You wanted to get out. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> you think you're mature enough? Many of us are not. And we deal with these small little issues and ditch the biggins. Biggins. What assumption are you making that's driving your relationships? This is way too deep for just to let this thing just sort of listen. Let me say it again. What assumption? is driving all of your relationships. They hate me. He's always like that. They'll never change. God's not really into that. I've always been that way. I tried one time. You know what? That's your driving theology for your relationships? Yes, it is. That's your theology. What's your assumption? My parents don't understand. My coach doesn't know how good I am. My teacher doesn't know. No one's really. My boss is stupid. I said, I said mentally, not out loud. It's driving your relationships. Let me give you a few myths I think that'll help you in all your relationships. Experience myth is number one. Experience myth. Because you think, well, if I'll experience a little more, 
then it'll change my relationships with my boss, my coach, my teacher, my this, that, or the other. No, experience will, will not necessarily make you wiser. It'll just make you older. <laughs> it, listen, it's not more experience. It's what you are experiencing and obedience therein right this moment. It's not some day down the road. I was meeting with a beautiful young couple. They can't wait to get married. And here's what I told them. Who you want to be getting married, you will be when you get married. Whoever you want to be. Oh, say, tell me some things. Oh, I want us to have a nice house and a little yard. And this, this. Are you saving down payment money? Oh, man, I don't make much money. Well, here's the thing. Let me tell you how to do that. Oh, man, I just want to be pure. And I want us to be able to have all the, okay, are you making out every night in the car and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, it's just different today. Does, see what I'm saying? You, you're setting up for the win. Experience will not make you have a great marriage. We talked about it this way. Saying I do does not prepare you for marriage. And then within marriage, experience won't necessarily make you wiser. It's evaluated experience that will make you better. Evaluate. Have you evaluated your relationship lately? Have you taken time? If you were part of our Romance Weekend, you had 17 questions to do evaluation on. I've had lots of great emails, texts, direct messages of people telling stories of how their life was impacted and changed. Uh, I've seen marriages turned upside down. See people walk out of the attorney's office and seeing their marriage impacted. I've seen that because they evaluated their experience. You can have more experience, but you have to have evaluated experience. Evaluate it. The scripture says it this way. Examine to see whether or not you're even in the faith. It's evaluation. Number two myth is the no better myth. The no better myth. Well, since I know better, I'll do better. See, people think, let me just give you one example. If I know everything possible about evangelism, then I'll be better at evangelism. No, you won't. No, you won't. You're going to be passionate about evangelism when you want to lead someone to Christ, and you'll do it wrong or incorrectly or a little bit um, uh, with lack of information. Why? Because you're passionate about it. I promise you, knowing how to swing a bat did not stop my two-year-old son from cranking a wiffle ball bat, the wiffle ball, straight into my wife's bridge of her nose. It did not stop him. He didn't say, man, I swing and I got to make sure and get, you know, get my wrist down and get my head down the bat and then follow. He didn't say that. He was still swinging. Knowing more stuff's not going to motivate you to do better. What you already know, you and I should confront and be effective in for God's best. You know, there's so many times where people say, well, I, I, I should have done this. If you confront the should have dones, the no betters will take care of themselves. I should have done. Oh, I should have prayed. I should have done this. I should have made the bed. I should have done this. I should have made a call. I should have texted. Should have, should have, should have. I mean, I know, I know, I know, I know is not going to get you there, but knowing better will take care of itself when you and I take care of the should have done. Oh, man, I should have. Take care of it. Don't just talk about it. The third myth, before we dive into 1 Corinthians and give us practicum, is the time myth. The time myth. Time is what so many times rushes relationships. And we think to ourselves, well, time's running out. No, it's not. You got plenty of time. Now, I'm not saying if you found God's best that you should date for four years and try to stay morally pure because there's a really high percent chance you won't. You want to honor God in that relationship and all this, that. But if you're single and you're sitting there going, oh, man, time's running out. No, it's not. You got plenty of time. I, I tell single people, do everything you want and ready for your marriage one day, like paying down a house or saving money for a house. Or looking for the opportunity to have a car paid off so you can then, you know, upgrade. And you've got everything where it needs to be. Get student loans knocked out. Get, you have time to make things better. No, the, the key is you're not running out of time. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. 
Time lets you hear better. Time lets you see better. It allows you to own things you've never owned before. And that's not just monetary issues. It could be social graces. It could be academia. It could be the opportunity to, to build a relationship that's going to better your career. Time gives you that. Don't be afraid of it. If there's anything Cindy and I talk about the most, when we're casually perusing through television or social media, is how old we must be because people we used to think are, were old don't look old anymore. I mean, I, I don't in any way want to be inappropriate or any way sound lustful, but there was a picture, my wife actually bought the book, of, of Christy Brinkley at 64 years old. It was on my coffee table. And I looked at her, and I was like, I just don't remember my grandma looking like that. <laughs> I just don't remember Granny. I don't remember going to go, Granny, I don't remember that. <laughs> and... As I sat back and thought, it's like, man, time is almost even better than it's ever been. It's kind of my point. You can do more. You could, you, listen, don't think you're running out of time. People are like, oh, we've been married 30 years. It's always been like, you done? I've been married 26 years. I got my best 26 coming up. I'm going to see more people come to know Christ. I'm going to see the church grow in an exponential fashion. I'm going to watch our marriage, our intimacy, our, our love for our kids, build our family, build a legacy, build a destiny. Time, you've got time. And if you don't take the time, you'll just blame time. And then if you start blaming, you'll never have a better future. I hear people all the time, they just blame, blame, blame. Blame will never promote you to a better future. You can do this. You can start over. You can make this great. You, can, you got this. And in all of this concerning relationships, God's word gives us ways that we can take all these myths, shun them, move into the relationships, which all of us at all of campuses, raise your hand, said you're in a relationship. So all of us can raise our hand and say we're in one. How do we love? Let me jump into verse number 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let me give you four ways to love so that you can ditch whatever excuse, myth, whatever you want to call them, and move in to becoming a great lover. Because God, you already know how to fill in the blank on this, God is love. And Paul has just expounded it here. Let's look at verse number 5. It says this, love is not self-seeking. If you believe God's word is true, say yeah. Okay, if you are seeking for self, you're not loving. Does that help anybody here? Is that too simple? Is that too simple? I mean, love that's self-seeking is not true love. Like, for instance, my wife, I won't say what she was eating, but it was not whole grain and it wasn't organic, and it did have the word Reese's on it, and it was in cardboard, and it was very large, and it did have peanut butter in the center. Am I helping anybody here? This, my wife had this. I opened a drawer up and supernaturally found it. And I was like, oh, well, uh, whose is this? Oh, I was just hiding it from the kids. So the other night, in love and reparation spiritually, she bought two. <laughs> Laid them on the bar. I wasn't in the mood for mine. I said, oh, I can't wait to have that tomorrow. Tomorrow came very quickly. <laughs> and it was very early. And I was like, oh, I can't wait. What in the world? And I just thought, who would have, and I opened Kate J's door, and all I could see is aluminum foil and, and exploded boxes, and he was sleeping, just smacking with chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> Can I just say that real quick? That's selfish. It's not love. And the crazy thing is, it was the shape of a heart. <laughs> I give you that illustration because you don't want a real one. Distancing yourself intimately from your spouse, selfish. Making it about you, selfish. Manipulation, selfish. Emotional distance, selfish. 
It's self-seeking. What are you interested in? Whatever it is, your spouse, the person you love the most, people love you, that should be the first thing you're interested in. How's that? I wouldn't amen that either. This is totally messing people up. Because most relationships deal with the your way issue instead of the our way. Take the why out. Oh, that'll preach. If you take your way and take the why out, you're not asking questions about it. You make it about you. You make it about our instead. We want our way. And let me just say this to singles because I love singles. If you give, 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 and they're all take, 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 you need to run, 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 run. You write that down right now and tweet it. I'm telling you he's got to squeeze your booty. Let me tell you right now, run. <laughs> Selfish sicko. I mean, I know y'all want me to preach something that you don't understand from Revelation. I'm not going to. Because this is where Jesus is the most exemplified every day, is the way we love in our assorted relationships. How about this? Love is not, <laughs> these are terrible. These are just terrible. I mean, God is love. I was good with that. And then Paul says, let's just take a moment for some exegesis. Let's take what Jesus said and go, boop, 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 boop. And he did. So he says, it's not self seeking How about this one? Love is not easily angered. You're not loving if you're easily angered. Oh, that's just the way I am, man. The way my dad raised me. I got stress in my career. It's money. And it's blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, man. Just kind of that guy, brah. The, the word I love here, too, is easily means stirred up. Stirred up. Love... It, love doesn't get wound up, and it doesn't get ticked up, not very easily. And then it says this, if you do get angry, it says, in your anger, Jesus says, in your anger, Paul also say, in your anger, do not sin. And definitely don't be easily angered. Here's what I would encourage. If I could just, I should have done this. I should have had Maria, my artistic wonder, make this sponge cut in the shape of a heart and all of us take them home that's what I should have done because if you will just you know what love does even though you may be failing or, or they may be failing you know what love does it just absorbs it love is the go bounty for a moment children of the 80s loves the quicker picker upper <laughs> yeah that's what I'm talking about love just absorbs it instead of reacts to it because here's what I can promise you. All of us are going to make a mistake with the people that we love. Then it's our turn, as we talked about last week, to carry them. That's what love does. That's what love does. Love is not ing easily angered. It absorbs it. it. It just takes it in and it doesn't throw it back. It just takes it in. And in other words, you put their story uh, ahead of your story. You put their needs and wants and priorities above yours because the, the, here, here's what I know and I was even trying to evaluate this for me because I know I make mistakes and, and get easily angered and blow up especially when I'm hungry uh, as a matter of fact it's not in my notes I just want to give you this don't ever make major decisions with the people you love the most four times in your life four times these four situations number one when you're hungry don't do it someone needs to write this down I, I'm, babe am I telling the truth I'm the most irritable when I'm hungry. When I'm hungry, number two, she'll know this one too. Don't when I'm angry. In my anger, do not sin, but don't make any major decisions. Don't come to me and go, you know, I'm thinking about getting a new car. Not, not good. Not a good time. You know, I just maxed out our credit card. Uh, let's don't talk about that right now. You know what? The dog just went all over the house, and I've got to go. Don't, no, not good. Not when you're angry. Not when you're lonely. Don't make major decisions. Don't have major conversations. And don't do it at the wrong time. And that spells halt. That helps somebody. There you go. 
You got anything you'd add to that? Yeah. Cindy said tired. I, I, I should have put hers in there so I wasn't so selfish. <laughs> when you're tired. Isn't that good? And I'm not easily angered. Let me just say, the right person, people say this. Let me say, well, if they were the right person, they wouldn't make me angry. That's a lie. That's, that's a lie. There are people not involved in my life that don't make me angry. And they're worse than probably what I'm experiencing. The only one that can make you angry is you. You're the response. You get to choose it. You say, well, the dog obviously ate too much food, went all over the house. Wow. I'll get right to that. Or I can go, you know what? I've always wanted to see him euthanize one of them pups. Let's take them now. That would not be a good response. Easily angered. They don't bring it out of you. I will say this. My wife pushes my buttons. I'm just going to tell you right now. I only got two, but she pushes them. And you know what I've told her before is they're your buttons too. So approach with caution. And the same for your spouse. My wife, I have two buttons. She has 14,000. It's kind of a more of a polytheistic button approach. But they're my buttons, so I've got 14,002. That's when you love. Is this good? Is this helping anybody? If this helping you, say yeah. yeah. I love. I'll take a free clap. Not easily angered. Here's another one. No one's going to like this. I'm going to say it anyway. Oh, actually, I didn't. Jesus did. Here's what it says. Love keeps no record of wrong. What? What is this? This ain't Oprah. <laughs> Love keeps no record of wrong. Let me say it this way. There's no filing cabinet in your marriage. There's an exact, there's none with, <laughs> hey, and not only that, with your kids. With your boss. With your assorted relationships relational record keepers rarely keep very good records on themselves oh they're good at everybody else's they don't have, they don't do very good on themselves and and let me just say this if you enjoy catching your spouse or the people you love when they're in trouble you got problems you got problems. I mean, there's times you got to scout out what's going on with a teenage son. I know that. You got to help things. I mean, there's times where I ask my kids questions knowing they didn't know if I knew or not just to see if they'd rat on themselves. That's fine. Why were you out so late? I, he just kept me out. I didn't even know he's got to keep me. I didn't even know they were out late. I just asked to see if they'd tell. I understand being a parent, but I also know you shouldn't be wanting to get the people you love the most always in trouble. Because that's not love. That's not what God does for you. No, it's not easy. It's difficult. But it's better. Because here's the thing. Here's what happens. Most of you are like, well, I'm right. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to keep record wrong. I just know I'm right. Can I tell you something? You can be really, really right and be really, really alone for the rest of your life. I mean, in my marriage, I'm probably giving way too many doors pitched open here, but I'm throwing another one out here. In my marriage, there's so many times where I would back my wife into a, a conversational corner because I can communicate. And then one of my mentors one time is like, just point blank said, it's like, Shannon, you may have been right, but you were completely wrong. That's not how you go about it. That's not love. And that cost me $165. You can be exactly right, but I promise you, especially if you're single, you, you're going to be really alone. I can tell you if you're married, you might be really alone too. Just forgive and live like you forgot. Forgive. 
and live like you forgot. Because everybody's like, well, I can forgive, I just can't forget. I know that. You're not God. I'm not asking you to be God. I'm just saying do this. Don't pay attention to it. Live like you forgot. Love them enough to do that. There's areas in your life when you know you can do that. Love, it, it's just not about stepping up, it's about stepping down. Philippians 2, 7, Jesus made himself, you ready for this verse? Jesus made himself nothing. Jesus made, Jesus made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. That's love. This is how you love people. And even when you're disciplining your kids and having to motivate them, there's a way you can do that and serve them. Why? Because your approach is to make them better. In closing, let me give you one more, and then we'll conclude this whole 1 Corinthians 13 in this series next week. But let me give you one more, and it's this. Love does not delight in evil. What does it do? It always protects. I mean, it goes on. It doesn't delight in evil. In other words, you can't go to bed on wrong stuff. It means you're not going to participate in wrong stuff as well. It means you can't categorically. Even this week, Cindy, you're like, man, we need to get that out of our lives. I mean, because as you grow, you're like, you recognize, it may not be sin for somebody else, but it is for us. We're like, we're moving out of that. We're done with that. And you will do that progressively as you grow anyway. But I'm not going to, I'm not in any way going to high five or delight in evil what does it do instead? Look at this. I, I love this. Here's what it says. Instead, protect. When? Always. Then it says, always trusts. You trust your spouse? Do you trust your best friends? Do you trust the people you're related with, working with? Love does. You're like, well, I, I don't know. There's a, get to know them. Have a conversation. Because I put away childish stuff, taking my soccer ball and going home. I'm inviting them to the tetherball court. We're going to hang out and talk and be big boys. Always trust. Always hopes. Is that good? I don't care if it's your marriage, your kids, a family member, a co-worker, and you're thinking it's dark. It's over. They're down. My marriage never can. Can I tell you something? Love always hopes and will bring the light of Jesus into any situation. Why? Because he is love. It always hopes. We got this. We do this. Come on, don't give up. I'm not quitting. I'm believing. Always trust, protects, hopes, perseveres. What does that mean? Never gives up. Never gives up. Here's what it does. It overlooks the rest and chooses the best. That's what love does. It doesn't mean I don't confront sin. That's not what it's saying. But I'm saying there's much more for many of you to celebrate, to push through some hurdles than to constantly always talk about the rest. Choose the best. Because here's the thing. Why do we want all this stuff but not be all this stuff? I, I've been to how many weddings? How many weddings have I even done? I don't know, hundreds. I've been doing this uh, June 9th, 30 years. I, I left. High school, my dad gave me a hundred bucks. I went straight into the ministry. And, and you, know, you know what I realized? I, I don't know how many, I'm going to say a couple hundred. I'm sure it's more than that, weddings. You know, most of them have 1 Corinthians 13. Everybody wants a 1 Corinthians 13 lover. They just don't want to be one. Here's your opportunity. You get to choose to be one right now. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. All campuses, make that choice. Right now, if you know there's one of the four categories that we've even mentioned, or maybe one of the myths, and you just want to see some change, I want to encourage you. With our Listen and Lead team members at the front, maybe take your significant other. Maybe if you're single by yourself, get up out of your seat and just say, hey, would you pray over me? I've got one of these four things that I'm wanting to rid, and I want to love as Christ loves. If you would be transparent enough with every head bowed and every eye closed, can I just say this? If you want... If you want and you know there is change and you're going to take a step toward change, no one looking around, would you slip your hand up? I not only want someone to love me like that, I want to be like that. I love that you can put them down. Hallelujah. 
I would encourage you if you're married to take your spouse by the hand and say, there's one of these four that we've got to talk about and just gently squeeze their hand and say, let's talk about it today. And I just want to say again to those of you that are seeking, maybe it's entrepreneurial vision, a new career, a, a, a spouse, a mate, whatever, you got plenty of time. You be the best you. Focus on being the best you so that when you run into them, you are ready. Don't rush through this moment. This is how we're going to change the world. Loving as Jesus called us to love. Jesus, you've pictured what love's all about. And I thank you for that. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I want to live it. And I pray that everyone in the sound of my voice, at all of our campuses, on Facebook, on Spotify, on iTunes, someone jogging right now, I just pray it would not be a neat thought. It would be something that we apply to our lives. And we'll just give you all of the glory and celebrate you, true love. In Jesus' name. Would you put your hands together and celebrate and thank God for what he's doing? Hey, if you're married in here, lean over to your significant other and say, you're, you're love. I, li I like you. And if you really want to get into it, put an E-R on there. You're my lover. I want to love you better. If your kids are there, say that to them. Lean over. Let's, let's make a conducive atmosphere to love better. As Brent comes and takes us through uh, this next opportunity to worship, can I say two things? Number one is this, February the 24th, make sure that's a Monday, sometimes I do this and I forget, February 24th, 6 o'clock, all of our campuses are either going to be live streamed uh, or I'll be at one of those campuses, 6 o'clock to 7.30. I, I'm going to do four truth talks, kind of, we're kind of taking the TED Talk vibe, and I'm going to just invite you, dinner, free child care. An hour and a half. And you don't even have to come for the dinner portion. Uh, all that's going to be RSVP, 6 to 6.30. It'll be dinner, 6.30. I'm basically going to teach for 12 to 17 minutes Q&A. First session is on where did the Bible come from. I, I hear so many people ask me questions. I'm like, well, let's answer them. Let's go for it. Four sessions. And we're going to do, uh, do them in, in February and March. Uh, most of them will be done Monday night. We'll give you the next one on February the 24th. Mark that down. Mark that down. And then I just want to say this as Brent comes. There are very few times, and I know my trustees are all listening to me at this moment. There's very few times that um, um, I, I, every week I get an email from the finance office, goes to the trustees, and it's basically an expense report of the week. I mean, it's like every little detail. I'd like to say that I pray over it. Uh, I don't. Uh, but they do. They do. And these guys are mathematician geniuses. And this week... This week on our detailed, uh, detailed uh, pay invoice, here, here was the email. Let's go! I was like, what's going on? And to see surplus, increase, giving, obedience, I want to give God glory for you, brand new church, doing what God's required you to do in worship. Thank you. Let's keep seeing God growing.